Hello, I'm Simon Godwin, the director of Twelfth Night, and it's great to be with you. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Tamsin Gregg, who played Malvolia in the production. Hello, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here also from my front room and uh, thrilled to be talking to Simon Godwin, who is in a different continent. Um, but it feels like we're in the same room. That's very nice. Thanks, Tamsin. That's right. I'm actually in Washington, D.C., where I'm running a Shakespeare theatre. And so Shakespeare is very much the theme, uh, especially on today of all days, as, of course, it's Shakespeare's birthday. Well, Tamsin, what a great opportunity to remember this show together and to, um, to talk about it. What, uh, I mean, I'd like to ask you, what are your, what are your big memories of doing it? Um, I remember it as being an incredibly uh, happy time. I love being in that company of, of performers. And um, I loved the, the amount of time that you get at National Theatre to... Um, to uh, investigate and collaborate and uh, and find out what on earth you're supposed to be doing and particularly as when I was first asked to do it I was quite resistant mm. uh, and felt nervous about taking it on um, ha what are your memories mm. well yes my memories are that it was enormously good fun there's something incredibly tender and life-affirming about that script, about this play. And I remember a company gathering that were very much shared in their energies and their kind of optimism, actually. And this play that is about grief and loss, but actually on the other side of grief and loss being love and humanity, um, was very strongly experienced, I felt, in the room by all of us. But um, it's good to remember that it was a really thoughtful and complex project to embark on. And I remember times in our early conversations uh, related to the whole question, which I'm sure folks will be thinking about, of this is the first time that the, certainly in Britain, the part of Malvolio has been played by a woman. And I remember our discussions about how could we do that? What would be the gain of doing that? What would be the terror of doing that? Um, and I remember those readings that we did together, uh, reading the play out loud, you and I, trying to go, yes, no, is it a good idea, is it not? Um, I mean, I have great affection for those moments, but the stakes felt quite high at the time, didn't they? Yeah, well, I, I remember sitting in the room with you, uh, reading it out. I remember you saying, well, let's read the play. And I was like, oh, well, uh, how is that even going to work? And just sort of sitting in, in the room, reading it and going backwards and forwards, you know, not each of us playing particular characters, but just saying the words and, um, and realising it's quite long. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also that it's... Uh, I mean, it's quite complicated. Mm. It, there's a big ensemble piece with lots of interweaving stories. But I think I remember early on when I was thinking about Malvolio, just how much he talks himself as a man. He talks himself as a, as a, as, as a he, and he's very, very clear on his pronoun. And so I felt very nervous about how I would ever approach that because I... I didn't see what value there would be in me playing Malvolio as a man. There was that moment I remember when we did change the pronouns and he became she and Malvolio became Malvolia. And going back and reading it then as a consciously female character, which allowed you to be the gender that you are in life, felt very liberating. And suddenly the story came alive in new ways and it seemed natural and believable. And I felt that was the moment when I could say to you, hand on heart, this is going to work and let's do it. And you rightly took your time and thought about that carefully and maybe we even did another reading. Um, and then you wonderfully said yes and we, uh, off we went. I remember uh, coming to you early on when we, when we were just thinking about it uh, and I, I thought about the feeling of someone realizing for the first time that they are loved mm. and that kind of giddiness and makes that feeling of, of not being able to quite uh, feel your feet on the ground. So I remember saying to you, um, so when she, when my early find, reads the letter and she finds out that she, she, she might be loved, can she fly? Yes. Can she, you know, just hover you know that's what I'm just it's like I'm walking on air just that hovering feeling and then you went away and we were quite quiet for a couple of weeks and um so I tentatively went back and said ah oh, do you know the 
that idea that I maybe you'd forgotten about it. I'd heard about it. And, she, and I remember you came back and said, oh, yes, yes, no, I did go back to National. We did talk about that. But they've just done Peter Pan, so no. <laughs> yeah, they spent all their money already on the, on, on, on the, flying, uh, on the flying machinery. So we'll go back to the workshop. But then, in, as a sort of little postscript, you then said, so, you know, you can't fly, but I can give you a fountain. <laughs> Great. So, I mean... Terrific. Uh, <laughs> I do remember actually in rehearsal time uh, seeing on the call one day um, uh, Miss Greg uh, fountain workshop and feeling a mixture of horror and um, idiocy at the thought that I was going to have to sit down with you and the design team and, the, and stage management and, and talk about a, a fountain as a concept. And yeah, we did. And then we sat down and, and I remember thinking, well, well, okay, so the fountain's a character. Mm. The fountain's a character in the scene. Um, so the fountain has to go on a journey. So what's wrong with the fountain? Yes, brilliant. Where we start with all characters, you know, what's wrong? What's, ha- what's wrong? What's wrong? What's the, what's the problem here? And then you go on the journey. And that's what Shakespeare, I think, does with these characters. Like, okay, so what's wrong here? What's the problem? I think you're absolutely right, Tamsin, that props are a character and you have a very natural sense of build, which I think is so intrinsic to comedy as well, that something has to grow, it has to get more extreme, it has to get more problematic in order for the comedy to also rise, hence the journey with the fountain that folks will be seeing. Um, getting wet every night, yes, I think I was very nervous about, about suggesting that to you, but another reason why you're so extraordinary as an actress is that you're, you do give yourself entirely to the process and to the character. And I, and I knew, as I was talking to you, that there was one part of you going, I don't want to do this, this will be awful, I will get wet every night, no. Another part that could see the glorious potential in this offer and was weighing those two things up and you brilliantly, heroically accepted the challenge, which is another good way of talking about the other big challenge, which of course was the um, reveal of uh, the yellow stockings, which you showed um, comparable uh, heroic courage in in engaging with. Well, I just remember thinking at the time, you know, for a Puritan um, in Elizabethan uh, theatre to come on in in, in yellow stockings at Cross Garden, it would have been, monstrous and um you know, you know the most wonderful way of diminishing uh, a pompous bully mm. uh, but then i thought well if it's a woman and um you know you put her in jazzy yellow stockings and she she'll look pro- she'll probably look quite good so you know that's that's not enough that's that's the beginning and so uh, then we started to think about um what how well if we're starting with with the tights because they're just tight the yellow tights where, where, where else can they go? How do you hide something in order for it to be revealed at the right time, but also, for, as you said, for it to build? And because I have uh, teenagers at home, well, I did at the time, I just imagined the worst possible things for them to see me doing. And um, that, was, that wasn't hard to come up with then, the things that would make them cringe. And... Um, <laughs> But again, what you, what you pulled off, Tamsin, was a sense of going back to the ecstatic, of going, this is a character who feels released, who feels seen, and who feels loved, and feels liberated. And it, it was very important, I think, for us that we got absolutely into the mindset of that character, that we didn't end game it. It wasn't a character that secretly feared this was going to go wrong. This was a character that was absolutely certain that it was going to go right. And somebody had given the green light to her carnal exuberance after a lifetime of hiding it and I think that's what justified it being such a theatrical moment of reveal in every sense. I know that some people felt that it was it was um, uncharacteristic that such a hard tough woman would suddenly behave in that way but I I'd actually experienced it I'd seen uh, in fact my own mum behave in that way when she'd got some news um, and suddenly became a sort of child, giddy with the knowledge that somebody loved her. And uh, so I sort of just built it around that, that, you know, the wildness, the ecstasy, mm. that's it, when they begin to smell the possibility that they're loved. I think that's beautiful, Tamsin, and it makes me think about metamorphosis. And this was a, a text by Ovid, a classical text that Shakespeare we know loved and 
based so many of his stories around. And Metamorphosis is essentially a story, a set of stories about people changing their shape physically. And I think his characters don't always change their shape physically, but they do change their shape psychologically and emotionally and they become butterflies in their own imaginations. And I feel very strongly that's what you found in Mavolia. Mm. But I think what was really brilliant and very, very interesting was the, the, the fact that you're very interested in re-envisioning Shakespeare and allowing women to play classically um, male roles. And what that then does uh, to the play when Malvolia is a woman, but Feste is also a woman, mm. and Fabian becomes Fabia. And what happens then to the way that uh, Malvolia is uh, demolished, and especially at the hands of, of women? And I thought that that was, that was very interesting. It then it comes away slightly from the, uh, the outing of a lesbian and then, and then destroying her. It then becomes actually about what women do to one another yeah. uh, to undermine each other when there is uh, potentially more judgment within that gender, gender of yeah. one another, but also... Yeah judgment in women and I think that was a very interesting uh, thing that you uncovered. There's no exclusivity to cruelty I mean all everybody has access to it and I was so keen to avoid any stereotypes be it for better or for worse we are in the end humanity and I think the extraordinary thing I discovered about the gender was that it was so powerful and yet as the play continued you sort of forgot who quite was a man or a woman, or playing a man or a woman, or and Shakespeare takes over, and his universal themes of the human heart conquer everything, and um, that was that was extraordinary to 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 see and to experience, to realise. And of course, let's not forget that um, that uh, it, it's all very silly. You know, the idea of Twelfth Night, where things are turned upside down. You know, it was traditionally when the king becomes pauper and and vice versa, and that there is room for extreme silliness and hilarity and. Um, you, I do remember having a lot of fun and laughing a lot in, in the rehearsal room with you. And um, so it makes it sound, we're sounding quite serious and quite academic, but actually it was really about what is, what is the best silliness that we can get out of this. And I remember saying to Michael Bruce, the composer, I said, so, so then the, the stairs are going to come around and then Marvoli is going to come down and then you're, there's going to be a number, like Marvoli's number when she comes down the stairs. He goes away and sets a Shakespeare sonnet to music Overnight, comes back and said, so I, I, I've, uh, I've, I've written you a song. I said, what? What? He said, well, you said Malvoli's number. I said, yeah, bit of music. He goes, no, 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 that means a song. I went, oh, no, I, no, 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 I didn't. I just meant some music. And he went, it's the song. You're going to sing a song. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> the cabaret number. I believe we genuinely made Twelfth Night funny. I mean, it's a funny play, but it's, it's not always funny in performance. And I think we captured that backache style of, um, of enormous, well, as my, uh, as my three-year-old twins tell me, uh, I'm a cheeky daddy. And I think um, one always wants to be a cheeky daddy when it comes to Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays were done, of course, in the open air. They were done in a huge open air auditorium where everyone could see everyone else. Everyone could, as it were, join in. They could shout out, throw cabbages or whatever. And again, it's so important in a modern theatre setting to create that feeling of engagement and involvement. And I think it was the skill of all the company to be able to receive ideas and reactions from the audience and actively play with that. And I hope that's something that even the broadcast contains or reflects. I hope so. There was one night actually where um, I could see backstage on the monitor, uh, there was a young person uh, leaning like that on the stage. They were sitting in the room and like that. And, I, and all of us backstage were going, someone is touching the stage. They're leaning on the stage, which, you know, it's sort of such that you can't, you can't touch the stage. And so I thought, oh, I think, oh what, what, can, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And then the next scene was when, I, when Marvoli comes on and discovers this big party and they've all been carousing and she's horrified at what they do and I went round the front of the stage and walked past this person like that and turned around and pointed directly at him and on the line said is there no respect <laughs> <laughs> and then just you know told him to get his hands off there and um and the audience really engaged with that kind of liveness of, uh, you know, of the audience being participants in it. But then I did feel, feel bad. And later in the letter scene, I did engage with him and, you know, get him on board because I felt I didn't want him to think I was being rude. 
Well, your, your kindness uh, triumphs, Tamsin. But uh, I think uh, I think the audience is very much there to be included and played with, and that's what that was a great example of. What summed up the whole spirit of the show, I think. 